just remind you, gentlemen, if you want to talk, you need to press the buttons and make it green. I know you don't want to talk, but that's fine. All right, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the May 16th meeting of the Camden Planning Board. Um, the first thing we always ask for is any public comments on non-agenda items. Seeing none. Um, the next thing on the agenda was a public information meeting about proposed subdivision at 18 Colcord Avenue. Um, Jim Dorsky, who should be giving the presentation, hasn't arrived yet. We're thinking maybe he's trying to find parking. It's pretty busy. So we were going to move on to um, the Historic Resources Committee just to give him a couple of extra minutes to get here. Um, is that okay? So, Pat, are you Pat Scaley? Sure. Um, and maybe I can just give a little... Um, Introduction to this. Um, as you recall, we um, a number of months ago we looked at, or at least talked about doing a demolition delay ordinance, um, and it, it didn't appear it was um, looked upon too favorably by by the planning board at the time. And I think it was a lack of understanding or where it came from and how we got to that point, or how the historic resources committee got to that point. Um, so. What I said to you folks is that I would work with the Historic Resource Committee and, and come up with some um, work with them. They actually did all the work, um, came up with a presentation to kind of give you the background and the history and why's and what for's on historic preservation and why it's important in a community. Um, and I also, just so you know, and I did pass out to you what were recommendations, questions, and strategies from the comprehensive plan that was um, approved by the planning board, approved by the select board, and then voted on and approved by the town at town meeting. Um, so if you go through the comp plan, you really ought to be implementing um, some of the things that um, are in that comp plan. And um, again, there are some recommendations on how to um, address historic preservation in town. And I think um, this demolition delay ordinance or this idea of one um, is an initial um, step in that direction. So um, with that said, I would introduce, um, and I know there's a, a, it appears to be a fair amount of people from the Historic Resources Committee here have interest in historic resources um, in town, so that's a good thing. And so we have Pat Scaling and Mike Scaling um, will um, lead the little discussion and then have some questions and answers time available after. Sound good? Thank you. Thank you. All right. talking or no? No. <laughs> He's my tech person. I'll stay with you. Okay. That's all right. yeah. I just wanted to introduce some of the people who are on the Historic Resources Committee or on the, in the audience in case you don't know who they are. Um, B.D. Parker in the front row and, and you probably, a, a lot of you probably already know. Well, I'm not a member anymore. Well, she is. She's an alternate member. Oh, yeah. You need to have your mic. It's on. You're good. Just pick it up. just got to make sure you're fairly close, Pat, when you're talking, so that okay, voice. We're initially. There you go. Okay. And Susan Nevis in the beige. And Judy McGurk in the beige. And Chris Fasselt down front. That's ever. Yes. <laughs> so in beige. <laughs> the beige group, right? Beige. <laughs> Coordinated. We're actually more colorful than that. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. And um, I want to thank Jeremy for arranging this opportunity for us. So I think it's really useful and productive when town committees share ideas and expertise and we're happy to be here. Um, first of all, I'd like to tell you about why we're here, how we got involved in demolition delay, why Historic Resources Committee is concerned, and why we think an ordinance is needed, and what other towns in Maine are doing for a demolition delay, and some of the advantages of having a demolition delay ordinance. So. I hope it's not long. I'll go as fast as I can. There are going to be some slides behind you, but that's not real convenient for you, but there it is. Anyway. Chairs do swivel. 
um, since around at least 2015, the Camden Historic Resources Committee has been thinking seriously about historic preservation and what makes sense for this town. We've been pondering, ruminating, and uh, incubating ideas and diligently educating ourselves in matters pertaining to the protection of historic resources. And by that we mean buildings, landscapes, neighborhoods, architectural sites, objects, and streetscapes. The committee has been reading articles listening to speakers, talking to professionals in the state. We really have been active in seeking out information and have learned a lot. We've been studying ordinances that have been adopted by various other towns and cities within Maine as well as as well as outside of the state of Maine, considering what Camden might learn and perhaps use in this particular situation. And when we were asked by the previous planning board I don't know, a year, two years, three years ago, to prepare a list of things we would like to see addressed in a historic preservation ordinance. We considered many approaches, really we've been thinking about it for a long time, and ultimately decided that a priority for us was to examine the loss of resources through demolition, that it, the demolition, was an important aspect and a good place for us to start in our preservation exploration. And to that end, the committee has read the preservation literature and firmly believes that our streetscapes, at that streetscapes of a town really create an indelible image that can invite new residents and visitors as well, or it can make no impression at all, resulting in no reason to stop, stay, or to visit again. I love that picture. I love the colors of the various buildings there. Anyway, make no mistake, there have been many tasteful renovations on Elm Street, Chestnut Street, Pearl Street, Mechanic Street, and others that have preserved and given new life and purpose to historic structures. And the committee recognizes that Camden and its residents have done a commendable job valuing the town's history and architecture and maintaining an authentic village look. In fact, it was due to the citizens of Camden that the Opera House, and I think we have a nice picture of that, the Elm Street School, the Mary E. Taylor School, oops, I forgot the post office, the <laughs> Elm Street School, and the Mary Taylor School, all in danger at some point in their existences, were saved from destruction. I don't know if you all know that, but they, all of those buildings at one point were going to be uh, removed. Um, so to date, Camden has averted some potentially harmful situations and it does re has done reasonably well in appreciating, protecting, and retaining properties valued, valuable to the history and essence of the town. But we need some protective regulations in place. Um, the committee's mission is to strike the right balance in ensuring that the preservation of our historic resources while considering the individual needs and the, goods of, and the good of the community. Our desire is to be proactive rather than wait for a crisis of loss before ha having some reasonable guidelines to follow. The committee's concerned if there are no guidelines or regulations in place that over time the town might lose its character through the loss of some of its important landmarks, both big and small, public and private, and it can happen so easily. Erosion over time is sometimes hard to detect until um, the damage is substantial. As I said earlier, the committee decided to focus on one aspect of historic preservation, the demolition delay. And we looked at the records from 2004 to 2006, and also records from 2012 to 2018, a total of 10 years of the demolitions that took place in Camden. And it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but think of it in terms of, you know, how many per year and what are those buildings we're losing. But um, for those 10 years, we lost 18 houses and cottages, four barns, four sheds, and one boat shed. And the years in between 2007 and 2011, we just didn't have good records. So, but I think the, that span of 10 years does tell the picture. Um, all of which 
not all of which were in the historic overlay area, but all were 75 years or older. And here's a few examples we're going to show you of things that we've lost. This is the Captain Fred Fry House, 1877. Some of us knew it as the Peggy Babcock House. It was at the corner of Chestnut and um, Fry Street. Um, this, and that was in the Chestnut Historic District, by the way. And so was this one. This was in the Chestnut Street Historic District, circa 1871. Some of you may recognize it as Araquippa. Uh, it was on Dillingham. This was in the High Street Historic District. We lost this in 2013, I believe. 1875, it was the Perry House. It actually was two houses that had been moved there and put together to make one house. And this is what it looks like today. <coughs> so, is that, I think, oh, there's just a couple more. Uh, Jacobs Avenue, we lost that just last year, 2018. And this, this is off Bayview Street, and it wasn't an older house. It wasn't 75 years old, but um, it did come down. There's a huge house in there now. This was in Rockport, but I put it because I just wanted to show you an example of what happens when infill happens. <laughs> and this is what's there today. Infill with no regulations. And some may think that's okay, and you know, we all have our opinions, but we we, these are all examples, I think, of quiet erosion. And citing these examples, we're not suggesting that all of these buildings should have been saved. We're just suggesting that perhaps there should have been a period of time to consider alternatives before bringing in the excavator. For the most part, the town and its citizens have demonstrated that they are diligent stewards and in caring for and protecting the things that make our town special. But we cannot trust that this will always be the case. As buildings are purchased by new owners and as intentions and tastes are often unpredictable, Historic Resources Committee believes that the town must take some steps in protecting its livelihood. Camden's image, its streetscapes, and its neighborhoods in addition to the harbor and other historic resources, which are our appeal, drive our economic engine. So just a few facts and figures now. Camden actually has about 2,800 homes and over 500 vacant lots at the present time. 1,300 of these homes are 75 years or older. We have three historic districts plus one district under research. We have 13. Um, on the National Register of Historic Places, plus two approved for application, and four National Historic Landmarks, and those landmarks are Schooners, the Grace Bailey, Mercantile Surprise, and then the Amphitheater and Library Park. But I should say we actually have add those four National Historic Landmarks to the National Register number, because if you're a landmark, you are also automatically on the Register of Historic Places. Um, oh, and at the bottom, just that's the summary of eight, the, what we lost in those 10 years, 18 houses, four barns, four sheds, one boathouse. Okay, so moving on. Um, let's see. So in case you haven't been aware of what we were covering or, or suggesting covering in the in the uh, ordinance, in a demolition delay ordinance. It's the three historic districts in the historic overlay map. And that includes Curtis Island, which is not, it's hard to see it in the overlay map, but those are the three historic districts, Bay, uh, High Street, Chestnut, and the Great Fire. Um, we're also suggesting town-owned properties, some of which are not in the historic overlay district. And currently, I just need to point this out. If you're in the historic district, you have absolutely no protection. There's no protection by being in the historic district, contrary to common belief. Later, I'll talk about these historic districts and property values. 
and just quickly, I just I think you already have copies of this, but if we could put if you could put up the highlighted areas, this is in the comprehensive plan, which says that the historic resources committee should maintain the unique character of the town's historic residential neighborhoods. We are charged with that. And moving on, oops, I guess that's the same thing. Keep going. <laughs> And then also in the comprehensive plan is this one saying that a, a historic resources ordinance would assure the preservation, protection, and enhancement of the historic properties of the town in order to promote the educational, cultural, and economic welfare of the town. That's also our responsibility, or suggested, recommended. And also recommended are to establish written guidelines for the preservation of designated local historic districts and for requests and approval of permits for demolition, alterations, or additions to listed sites and buildings within historic districts. I'm trying to make the case that we're not overstepping our bounds. <laughs> and then last, uh, review all construction and demolition projects planned in the historic areas overlay map in conjunction with the town code enforcement officer and the town planning board. And so these were recommendations. You weren't on the planning board then, Richard was, but when the comprehensive yeah. plan was written. I know you had a big part in that. So just so you know, that that's what was recommended for us to be active in. So what other towns in Maine have demolition delay ordinances? And here is a list of the um, forward thinking towns we think in Maine. And some of these also have general historic preservation ordinances and their demo delay is within their general ordinance but those but all of these have something to say about demolition delay and that's not a, a full list either thank you mm -hmm. and so what do they have in common we'll just quickly do this one what do these uh, demolition delay ordinances have in common next slide i think no Okay, um, they actually name the properties. They define whether it's a whole or partial demolition. They define the length of the delay prior to the demolition. They state a notification process for community and neighbors. They state the terminology and definition and they define a process for obtaining a demolition permit. And we actually have written a draft one and we have all of those things in it and then maybe someday you'll get a chance to look at it. But not today. <laughs> um, so now just talking about historic buildings as an economic engine, Donovan Rip Ripkema, who teaches preservation ec economics at UPenn and has a master's degree in economics of historic preservation, cites four major areas. Oh, I forgot about this one. I was moving on too fast. This just shows the different delay periods. They vary. Uh, some of them are hard to f find, but some are 120, 180. They go anywhere from f 45 to 90. So you can, you can look at that some other day when we get down the road, if we get down the road. Yeah, and I can probably share this, this whole presentation with the, um, with the planning board via email so they at least can have it. And okay. you can probably... Put it up on the town's website too. Okay. Yeah. That's all right. Okay. Well, moving on to Donovan Rick Rickma, who is really the most quoted person in uh, economic factors that, in terms of historic preservation, he cites four major areas in which historic preservation have proven to be an economic driver. One is downtown re revitalization of historic buildings always brings new net businesses and new net jobs. And mostly he talks about cities, but I think it's, it also holds true for small towns. You have reno, renovation, revitalization downtown, you have new businesses that will move in. Um, number two, he says historic preservation attracts heritage tourists. And by heritage tourists, um, he means people who are interested in history and heritage. And he calls cultural tourists people who just want to go visit the coast of Maine, for example, but aren't necessarily interested in history. So his, his 
research shows that 80% of cultural tourists are heritage tourists, and that consistent results of heritage-based tourism figures show that heritage tourists in general spend 30% more than cultural tourists. They spend half again as many nights in hotels. In Florida, for example, in one year, 470,000 more international visitors visited historic sites than went to amusement parks. And he says that 785,000 more visited historic sites than went to the beach in Florida. Three times as many visitors went to historic sites than to casinos, and four times as many went to historic sites than played golf. Just kind of interesting, I thought. He also says in San Antonio, a study showed that 50% of all visitors are heritage tourists, and they're not going to watch the Spurs, I guess, but he says the heritage visitors outspent all others in hotel, transportation, food and beverage, retail and recreation per person than any other visitor. So we really, you know, want to stress the the importance of the historic of this town. Interestingly, he said only 7% of heritage dollars are spent in the historic sites that drew all the visitors. 93% of it was spent on hotels, food, lodging, 7% at the actual site. So, um, his third area was jobs and income, and it's, that's kind of a no-brainer that jobs and income are generated by the jobs and materials needed in restoring and rehabilitating historic buildings. And four, impact on property values. This was very interesting to me. He said, property values in historic districts tend to outperform the market as a whole. 14% higher for buildings that are in the National Historic District, and 22.5% higher for buildings in the local historic districts in Philadelphia. And the reason for that is, why would that be, you ask, it seems counterintuitive, but the National Historic District not, designation is honorary with no protection. And the local historic districts offer protection with regulations. More regulation means higher value. People will pay a premium for the confidence that the person across the street can't do something goofy that will adversely affect their property right values. And I can see that. <laughs> so in Louisville, over an eight-year period, uh, Rick, 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 Rip Kama says that uh, in, it, uh, in Louisville over an eight year period, property values of historic properties outperformed the market by about 21% in appreciation. In Canton, Connecticut, local historic district properties outperformed the national register district properties. Remember those with regulations? And in Savannah, Georgia from eight, 1999 to 2014, every local historic district with regulations outperformed the city as a whole. And he also talked about foreclosure rates uh, being lower in historic districts because property values decline slower for historic properties. And in downturns, historic properties decline but experience less steep declines and they level out sooner. So that's, that's it for Mr. Rick, Rip Kama. But I want to talk about sustainability and then I'll be done. So. Um, Cade Benefield, who is a senior counsel for environmental strategies for Placemakers, LLC, wrote an essay in 2012, and it was updated in 2016, about why historic buildings matter to the environment. And he quoted architect Carl, Ele Carl Elefante saying, the greenest building is one that's already built. And you've probably heard that before. But because you don't have, um, and he added, but because you don't have to use environmental resources in constructing its replacement. And so that's why. But especially considering the advanced green technology available now for new construction, do the facts back that up? And what Mr. Benfield says is that he, he looked at the Preservation Green Lab of the National Trust for Historic Preservation study released 
uh, in 2012, and it, it addressed these important questions. The study concluded that it can take between 10 and 80 years for a new energy efficient building to overcome, through its more efficient operations, to overcome the negative energy and climate change impacts caused in the construction process. The study cautions, however, that there are environmental resources expended in rehabbing an older building as well, and care must be taken in the selection of materials used in the rehabilitation or adaptation of older buildings, since the benefits of reuse can be reduced or negated based on the type and quality of materials selected. And the executive summary said every year approximately one billion square feet of buildings are demolished and replaced with new construction in the United States. The Brookings Institute projects that some 82 billion square feet of existing space will be demolished and replaced between 2005 and 2030, I mean 20, yeah, 2030. Roughly one quarter of today's building stock. In other words, in one quarter of the buildings that are in existence today will probably be demolished between 2005 and 2030. That seems impossible to me. Um, yet few studies to date have sought to examine the environmental impacts of raising old buildings and erecting new structures in their place, in particular the climate change implications of demolition and new construction as compared to building renovation and reuse remain under-examined. So major findings from that report include building reuse typically offers greater near-term savings than demolition and new construction. The study finds that for that five of the six building types in the study, they studied single family home, multifamily building, commercial office building, a mixed use building, and an urban village, a uh, mixed use building in an urban village, an elementary school, and a warehouse conversion. Using those six building types, it can take eight, 10 to 80 years for a new building that is 30% more efficient than the average performing existing building to overcome the negative climate change impacts related to construction. And another found finding was that benefits are maximized when building reuse is practiced at scale. Retrofitting rather than demolishing and replacing just 1% of Portland's, and they're talking about Portland, Oregon, of course, Portland's office buildings and single family homes over the next decade would help meet 15% of the county's total CO2 reduction targets over the next decade. So that's pretty interesting. Just 1% of the buildings would help meet 15% of their CO2 reduction. And the greatest environmental benefits of reuse are achieved by minimizing the input of new construction materials. And the only place where the uh, findings were not so great, the study found that the conversion of older warehouses to apartments or condominiums typically yielded smaller to negligible near-term climate and energy benefits compared to the new construction. One conclusion to be drawn from this finding is that it is especially important to take advantage of green materials and construction techniques in working with this type of project. That said, the study shows that for most building types, adaptive reuse of older, building, older buildings produces measurable and sometimes impressive green benefits. I'm not going to go any more on that, but anyway. So, although demolition delay is a limited tool, it is a window of opportunity to save a threatened building or property. It's not a guarantee of saving a property, and we don't want to save every property, but it's a, at least it's a chance to take a double look. It's the least we can do. Uh, doesn't a building that's endured 75 to 200 years deserve a longer look before being demolished? And isn't it wise to think of the economic benefits and sustainability sustainability benefits in reuse and adaptive use. So anyway, those of us on the committee, thank you for listening to this and letting us share our information and just say that we have some ideas for that demolition delay ordinance which we've given to Jeremy for your use going forward. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. I mean, do you want to entertain questions, thoughts, comments from you folks, and maybe from the public? I think is important too. Um, that's all right. Do we want to take questions from the public first? 
and then sure and then and then we can get into a discussion if anybody has a discussion, comments and then, that would be good yeah. Thank and you, I, I will say that I do have a copy of the sustainability, or I can give you the link to Mr. Benfield's entire article. It's really, I think it's really good. Okay. Yeah, and I, I have Donovan Ripkema's book, The Economics of Historic Preservation, and it is, it is a fascinating, um, fascinating read. Um, Thank you. So, yeah, why don't yeah. we take some comments from the public? Maybe I'll step aside. Um, or or Pat can step aside. I'll step aside. All right. Do we need to have people sign in if they're coming to yes. say anything? Yes, and I'll have a, I have a pad right here and a pen. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. okay. Is there anybody who would like to comment or have any questions in the public? No? Nobody? No? Okay. Oh, okay. Beedy, if you'd like to come forward and just sign your name. And <coughs> Come up to the microphone, thank you. Um, yeah, I hadn't been planning to say anything, but since climate change was mentioned, I thought I'd continue with that. One of my concerns is that I really think we will have climate migrants, not, not the border of Mexico, but people from further south moving here and I've met some already. They want to come to Maine. And they will be interested in these houses. Um, at the moment, we have a huge stock of houses where nobody's living there. I don't know if they're uh, investment houses or if they think they're going to live there, but it, it would be really interesting to know how many people actually live in all the village houses that make our town what it is in appearance. But so I, I guess what I'm sitting here to say very briefly is that I think a lot of people will be coming who will be interested in living here and that having a demolition notification and delay ordinance would help in that transition. How, can, can you just explain how you think it would help? Um, I think that people come here sometimes who are very attracted by the appearance of the town and the way the town works, but they don't necessarily realize that if they completely change their house, they will be changing the town. It, it's a funny thing. It's like people move. I mean, we did that with this country. Uh, people move into an area because they love it, and then they change it. That, that happens. So you see this as a, as a way of, of giving people some kind of time to consider more closely what well, yes, they want yes. to do? Yes, if, if, Well, what I've mentioned, um, why notification? At the moment, you can get a permit, and then the next day it's done. And that's often the way people do it. They do it as quickly as they can, so nobody will <clears throat> get in their way. But if you do that, particularly this happened with Peggy's house, um, it was sold to people who it was thought that they were going to keep the house and then they changed their mind. You don't really forgive people who do that. And they live next door to you. It would be better to talk about it for a little while. It doesn't have to be a long while. So that's notification. And then delay is part of that. And of course there are lots of complicated things that you can do to delay it more and more and more which you will probably have some say about. Okay. Okay. Aren't necessary. Right. So that's my thinking about notification. I would do it for the whole town because it's always upsetting when a house comes down next door. Right. And then you live side by side. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Again, I just wanted to clarify that we're talking about demolition delay for town-owned properties and the historic overlay district, not for the entire town. Okay. I'm the one who's talking about the whole town. Sure, sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Notification for the whole town. Okay. If we don't have any more comments from the public, do, does anybody on the board have any thoughts on what you've just heard? 
Well, uh, I, I kind of agree and understand uh, what Beatty is saying. It's, I mean, this is a traditional New England town that has a lot of character. And for people, you know, somebody to come from Texas, California, probably Mexico, to come here and say, well, this is the way we do it where I'm from, and change the entire environment. It, it happens. And uh, we should protect it. Well, there's nothing new about that Kittery Bridge Syndrome. You know, people move up, they change it to be like where they come from, and then they want the bridge blown up because they don't want any more in-migration here. He made a very good point to me. Uh, last time you folks were speaking about the delay, um, I was sort of concerned where, you know, who, who's managing the delay? And uh, if, if somebody wanted to do something to their property, but a neighbor that had some sort of either ill feeling or whatever uh, could could delay things, that, that to me seemed to be arbitrary and not fair. But as Beatty pointed out, if there's a delay and uh, you know, people discuss it with each other, but then you know, <coughs> we're agreeing or we're looking at each other's point of view and not holding just a grudge. That's, that's another thing that, that I had thought about, Richard, is, is in the delay process, it should be more of a, a review process mm -hmm. than an in, intentional delay. I mean, there are some houses that just need to be torn down mm -hmm. and do it. Uh, but if, if there was a demolition planning board review, <coughs> then the decision could be made then and there by yep. the planning board. And if there were issues within the community that, that wanted to delay it, it, it could all be worked out and right. talked about. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because that is what we had in our plan was that initial period is a time to talk about it mm -hmm. and decide and the planning board making a decision, is this a significant building to keep or is this one to and then the process is over. You don't have to have a 90 or 120 day delay. So it's- But, but to be like clear, it, even if it was decided that that building was significant, mm -hmm. and unless somebody comes ahead and wants to remove that building, unless somebody comes up with a way to save that building, it will nevertheless be demolished at the end of this period. Is right. that correct? Right. But but there is that cushion of time mm -hmm. to make considerations, to see if there's another owner, to for the owner to change his or her mind. Yeah. But in the end, um, right. if, if there's no change of heart or new buyer or new plan, then yes, after the delay period, it comes down. That's generally the case with most demolition delay ordinances and then once you get in once so generally how these work communities adopt a demolition delay ordinance because they're concerned about historic preservation and what the character of the community is uh, and the potential loss of it once that delay ordinance is in place for a little bit of time I think what ultimately ends up happening is is just as you're saying that the building ends up going away eventually anyway, even though there was a delay period. And that what, what that has done is that has pushed communities then to go further and create a historic preservation ordinance, which actually looks at design standards and for alterations and then even in demolition, then you get in the demolition process. Sometimes there, it, you may not be able to demolish some buildings under that process. Um, you have to offer the property for sale for X amount of time. Um, it's it's quite a can be quite an involved process, but I think this demolition delay piece is the initial start um, to trying to protect a community. Um, I think Pat's and the committee's work on um, they have kind of an elaborate flowchart on if this then this, 
um, and they have a, actually a pretty simple version of that that I'll share with you in upcoming meetings because I think this is a, a good initial start to this conversation. Um, and I think you're right, some buildings ought to come down and on those buildings, if they're over a certain age, it's, it would be easy to come to the planning board, planning board make a determination, this is not a contributing building, not a significant building, move forward, and that building demo can happen you know, 12 days or 14 days after um, their initial application to the planning board. So that it's really not gonna hold up a lot of projects. Um, I'm just throwing comments out. I mean, I, I was historic preservation staff person for Bangor for um, 10 years, so I, they had a full-blown historic preservation. They were a certified local government under the National Park Service, so I have a fair amount of experience dealing with historic Did they have a resources. demolition delay? They did, built into their historic preservation ordinance, um, and it was very hard to demolish the buildings. There was a garage, there was an old house that, um, neat old house, um, and a fire, it got engulfed, you know, in, in a fire, and there was a um, carriage house garage sort of building on that property I think that's still sitting there today um, and they the town the city actually owned that property after taking it for back taxes after it burnt um, and then the city tried to take it to the historic preservation committee of the city to demolish this garage um, and the historic preservation commission said no um, so it, I think it's still there today, that garage. Don't give, you shouldn't give them the bad examples yeah. for historic was, preservation. Was there any negative? Well, it was, was there any garage. negative? It was a neat right. garage. And, you know, the idea, was, <laughs> the idea was to actually redevelop that house, put a new yeah, house sure. that fit in with the neighborhood, that met the historic preservation standards, and they'd have this old carriage house garage still on the property. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that was the intent. And I'm glad the Historic Preservation Commission just didn't cave because it was a city project. Um, yeah. You know, um, there was another one, the old waterworks property. I don't know if you're familiar with that property up on the um, north of Eastern Maine Medical Center is the old Bangor waterworks. And it got converted into um, low income housing. It's a fantastic project. Um, but there was the old engineer's house on that property. Um, and that, um, w for a long time, we were trying to get them to save it. And mm -hmm. then it deteriorated over time, ultimately, unfortunately. And then in that case, they did come to the Historic Preservation Commission multiple times. And then um, it did end up going away. That one did, just so you know. So, so as proposed, we're talking about just the delay notification aspect. Is there any studies on the efficacy of that procedure? Like, is it something that actually yields results? Or is it sort of a, you know, I mean, I, I know how neighbors can be. Some neighbors are great, and sometimes, you know, somebody comes in and says, whatever you say, I'm going to do whatever I want. You know, it's my property, and you're going to get both those viewpoints. I, I mean, I think we can look for them. I haven't seen one specifically, but I'm sure the Maine Historic Preservation Office staff um, probably is aware of something, and I mean, I can certainly dig around for something like that. I mean, I'll just be curious. So, I mean, it, and, it, and it is then sort of envisioned this is a step towards maybe going a step further? Well, I think it's important, you know, communities are always, um, you know, we spend all this time on drafting these comp plans, and you're supposed to move forward. This comp plan is supposed to be something, and it's supposed to kind of create what your community is and will be in the future. Um, if you read these recommendations that, again, the planning board reviewed, select board reviewed, the town voted on, I know everyone doesn't read every single page of this whole document, right? Um, but in there, it's pretty clear, um, mm -hmm. you know, what, what the intention is and what the recommendations on how to preserve and protect the character of Camden, um, how you do that. I will say the Historic Resource Committee, I mean, they are a dedicated, um, dedicated folks that have spent a lot of time doing this stuff and they're, they've done some of these things already. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they're doing research, they're conducting surveys and, and trying to move through that process and, but they don't have the means to um, enact any regulations or any, you know, we got to move this from this committee over to the planning board and then take it um, further. So mm -hmm. they're doing their part and I think we ought to at least do our part moving forward um, to address it and 
I mean, there's public hearings and all this. So, I mean, who knows where it will end up ultimately yep. and this town vote happens. So that's the beauty of town government. Um, but I think we ought to really address some of these um, and, and try to at least work on these over time. So one other thing I see as a stumbling block as you're like developing this process is when you get into the negotiations, you've got a historic house. The owner wants to tear it down. They're going to wind up tearing it down. So you figure out, well, is somebody in the community willing to help dismantle this house? Will they take the columns? Will they take the windows, the trim, whatever? Well, then it becomes a liability issue for the property owner. So, <clears throat> yeah. how would you address that? Could you draft up some sort of a, a, a waiver? Mm -hmm. A disclaimer um, or some sort? I don't know. That's a, that's a tough one. I mean, that ends up becoming a, 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 a private matter between the owner and the person that wants to salvage it and not an issue for the town. That's so my, that's, the town should not get, go down that road. Mm -hmm. um, and be involved in that process. That is a private matter between um, a developer and a salvager. Um, I'm just, that's my, my gut on that. Um, I, one thing, um, just going, and one thing that we can do and I think we should do if we go down this road, and I haven't seen it in, um, in, his, in demolition delay ordinances, but you see it all over the place in, in um, federal historic tax credit projects and, and um, like the waterworks in Bangor, they were doing significant alterations to that property and it went through the federal park service and went through the, the state SHPO on this. And when you're significantly altering and they determine there's a significant alteration, but they were gonna issue the permit anyway to change this building. Um, and since there was federal funding in, involved, that's why it was going through this process, but they were required to do a a recordation of that pro of the property and all of the equipment in there and what the building was like at the time of demo and they do it I mean there's a whole process you you know you have to be a um, architectural historian and a photographer to like document it per the park services way to document um, historic properties and then that could probably be stored in the li in the public library or we can store it here um, it's just a way to retain some of that history that you ultimately will lose. So that's something that we could do and make part of it. And I think that makes, that kind of makes sense. I mean, if we're concerned about the character and what was there, um, you know, that's just something to think about. Another, following on Mark's stumbling blocks, another one I could see is that it seems like this flow chart that's gonna be developed, flow, flow chart for each project, right? That's what you were talking about earlier, like. Well, it's just it's just a um, it's a flow chart on how you would get through this pro through a process. Yeah, well, it, and it's developed, and they have done spent yeah. a lot of time on it, and I'll share it with that, you. Um, soon. There should be recognition of the construction season in Maine. I I understand because it would do no good to um, sort of go through all this process, you know, like treading water. And then getting up to the point where you say, okay, you can go ahead, and that go ahead might be like January 1st, which means that the owner is gonna incur considerable additional expense for winter construction. So if there was like warning way back before the yeah. treading water goes, then people could, <clears throat> better arrange a construction season. I mean, I think that's, you have all, you have that kind of scenario every time you, and I agree with you, I mean, that we have a limited construction season in Maine, but anytime you have new regulations, whether it's zoning ordinances, sign ordinances, historic preservation ordinance, there is always a learning curve and there was, there's always that, no matter what it is. I mean, we have new building codes, right? I mean, the legislature right now is going through new building codes and looking at adopting new codes for the state. And when they do that, they will be, and I'm on the state building code board, on a date certain, those new codes will, will apply. Um, and builders and designers may have been planning to build a house, been working with architects, but all of a sudden, there are new codes that apply. I mean, so 
there's going to be a period of time, ultimately, all it always happens that some people may get caught off guard or a developer may get caught off guard or a project manager that i mean we'll try to limit that to the best of our ability and try to and try to educate about something like this the, you know an ordinance like this um just so that people are aware that it's out there but i think you run into that no matter what it is um there's always changes to plumbing codes electrical codes that happens and plumbers aren't always on up to speed on the new plumbing code, but we show up at their site and say, hey, you can't do it like that anymore. And meanwhile, they bid it out a whole certain way. I mean, they need to adapt and people will adapt over time. Just throwing that out there. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts? Matt, anything? I think we're good. You, what harm do you think this could cause? What harm? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, if we don't do this or if we do do this? If things stay the way they are right now, yes. If they stay the way they are right, right now. Right now, we don't do I mean, well, I guess if this happens, what, what, what do you see as the potential issues in putting that? I mean, that's what I'm a little bit... If we I, adopt, I can see if you've got some very positive <laughs> things, but things are never 100% ever. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested on a practical level in these ordinances that have been put in place. <laughs> And, and from your experience when you were working in Bangor, what, are, what have been some of the difficulties of working with something like this? Um, just that sometimes people aren't aware mm -hmm. and, you know, that they didn't know they needed to go through a process. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, I just, it's the same what I just said. I mean, unfortunately, that's, you can do as much as you can do to educate people and, and raise awareness in the community that you have ordinances that regulate or review certain types of projects. Um, and you can't always make everyone aware and bring everyone up to speed. Um, and I think that's really what it is. You know, they didn't know. Um, well, um, we do the best we can to educate. But um, I think that's that's the only harm that I see um, is that you're going to find some people that weren't didn't know about it, they didn't plan for it, right. um, but you know it also requires people to plan. I mean, life requires planning. Mm -hmm. um, I think there could be some misunderstanding out front that it's not covering every building in town and not every building because it's yes. in the historic district is going to be saved. I think the education part will be important so people know that we're not saying, oh, you can't, you can't do, you can't take that building out, it's in the historic district. Well, maybe you can. I mean, it's yeah. really, yeah. And also you would think that the real estate professionals would be the educational, sure. you know, focal well, point. Yeah. Sure. I yeah. would hope so. I mean, I, you kind of always if rely you're selling, on that. selling a property that's, that's in, one of the overlay <clears throat> districts and is likely to be under this ordinance. I will say what we did in Bangor too, because we were running into this when properties changed hands, either they didn't get the information from the realtor or they just didn't do their own due, dil due diligence. We ended up sending a notice, just a, a welcome to Bangor, welcome to the historic preservation district. <laughs> FYI. <laughs> and, we did that. and people thought that was helpful. Um, because we were running into that, um, you know, where they didn't, um, they didn't know. Yep. And how do, how do you stay ahead of that? And we would send those, um, you know, every, I think every five years we were sending um, information to all the real, real estate firms in Bangor. Mm -hmm. And we weren't getting everyone, obviously, but, mm -hmm. you know, we'd send a, a little packet, historic preservation, and it laid out all where all the historic districts were and laid out a process on, on what was required. It was a, you know, four page little sheet that showed listed the districts, defined what they were, and listed broadly what the requirements were. I think we would do the same thing here. I mean, Camden's small enough that I think that's doable, and I think people would appreciate that. Congratulations, your house is going to appreciate 22.5% per, more, but you can't change it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that no, you can't change true. it, so you be careful about, yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, this is a... Make alterations. Right, this is a review I mean, if you go and, down, this is just demo. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah. And it's, demo. as Mark was saying, review and delay. I hope that when we take this upon ourselves that we change the wording to be review and delay as opposed to just being delay. Yeah, you know, a combative stance of delay, mm -hmm. which is... Um, it's a good not the right language. So, uh, Mark, I thought, uh, again, this idea of review and delay, and then the fact that it is 
restricted or reserved for these historic districts. Um, as I've mentioned to the board previously, um, um, we purchased a home in a historic district in another state. Um, there were certain uh, ordinances, restrictions that were involved in that purchase. Real estate agents knew about it, clearly stated from the get-go. So as a purchaser, we could make an informed choice. Mm -hmm. And I hope the same will happen here in Camden. Mm -hmm. Was yeah. that like a required disclosure? Again, I don't know legally if it was a required disclosure, but it was certainly on all the uh, material that we were handed, and it was um, forthcoming from the real estate agent right away. It's we a selling point. That's how they added well, another it is a selling point. Well, the customer. And in our case, it was a selling point because we were interested in arts and crafts style homes. We wanted to make sure that these particular homes were going to be preserved. We wanted to be a part of that preservation effort. Mm -hmm. uh, we would hope that people who would buy in the historic district here in Camden would have that same either cultural, community, or aesthetic uh, consideration when they purchase a home in the historic district. And something like a review and delay, although it's on the back end of that, um, would be uh, forthcoming in the sense of at the time of purchase or the time of consideration of purchase? Well, in a real estate listing, you've, in, in the listing itself, the zone is right. listed and specified. So I mean, as soon as you say historic, that's going to raise some questions right there. Mm -hmm. You know, for yeah. any educated buyer, it would certainly say, well, what's, what's this? Yeah. So a lot of it has to do with education, as you would say, education and communication. Uh, you know, I think the committee looked, they were looking broadly, the Historic Resource Committee broadly all over town. Um, and I, there's a lot of value to that. But at the same time, um, I think we need to kind of really protect what, what um, kind of the core of Camden's village and character is. And, and that's really, I think, in these historic districts. Um, and so we kind of, I think I steered the committee down that road, and that was probably the best way to um, to start. Um, well, it so. certainly evolved. I mean, in my short time on the on the board here, I mean, it's gone from this broad, you know, 800-pound gorilla to now a very focused review and delay, and within these specific districts. And I think that's something as a board we should look to take on in the near future. Yeah, okay. I agree. In the case of the property you looked at in another state, it yep. turned out that. that the the review turned out like to be an advantage to selling it was absolutely yeah because you were buying and you knew exactly what you were getting into and that was the idea and we would hope that the same would be here oh i'm buying on high street or i'm buying on pearl street mm -hmm. it has a certain aesthetic it has a certain as you said i love your presentation in terms of the economic benefits that you know this is kind of a common denominator for everyone oh my gosh my house is gonna be worth 22 percent more because i'm buying and, and the review and delay. Okay, that's the price I pay or is it something that I should know about when I approach this property. And have you learned from some of these houses that have been demolished? Like I was familiar with uh, a couple of them. And uh, one of them that you showed that the house was completely demolished, um, I'm quite familiar with because I, I believe I abut that property. But um, have you, and, and the decision was made by the owner it, it just happened immediately there was no one right no one i had actually done a plan to to rehabilitate that house to an extent uh, easy and nothing nothing too you know uh, great but and and then same with peggy babcocks it seemed like it was like here today gone tomorrow mm. exactly so mm -hmm. have you learned from that First request for the delay ordinance was oh. um, the notice came out that they wanted to tear that down. So there was a, a bit of public. Okay, well then that then. one I shouldn't bring that one up, but <laughs> other <laughs> other ones. I um, mean, can you learn from these? Wow. The case of that one on Marine Avenue, it's like it just. <laughs> and and to what, you know? Ah, yeah. yeah. What result? I mean. What was the mm. reason? <laughs> are you proposing just full demolition of an entire building, or are you proposing that this would also apply to renovations and partial demolitions? Well, I think that's up to the, you know, whatever you put in the ordinance. I, I think a partial, a partial. You're saying it's our job, or is that your job? I mean, who who gets to make that decision? Because well, to me, I mean, that's significantly. That I think it's significant, and this just. 
I think this is, I think this was where we got stuck when we were talking about this originally, when mm -hmm. we first brought this ordinance to you folks many months ago. Mm -hmm. This is, this is where we got stuck was, I think it was about an L or if they're demolishing a barn, barn. on the house, does that, was that going to kick in this or review ordinance? Um, I think that's where we got stuck. So, I mean, I think we can, uh -huh. what I'd recommend is, um, you know, just continue this conversation and we can work through some mm -hmm. of this. Um, yeah. And, you know, um, what, I, what we probably ought to do is just maybe share your most recent, the most recent draft again, and just let you folks, yeah. you know, think about it and opine on it for a while and then, and then come back and have a, have another okay. thoughtful discussion. Uh -huh. I mean, November, Sound. you know, if we take something to, um, to town vote and it is would be in November and so um, by probably mid September we would have to have the hearings all done um, but so I think we have a couple of months to kind of review uh -huh. things go fast <laughs> August, August. <laughs> I, I keep looking behind she's right behind me. Just to <laughs> we, we didn't address you know partial or whole in the first time around and I, you know I'm I'm just thinking ahead it's really the streetscape that matters and so what's behind there if it's a barn or an L or something and it doesn't affect the streetscape it's Create some sort yes. of terminology exactly. that would trigger it. Yeah. And, and, yeah. You know whether it's a percentage or. Right. Yep. And that can be done. We just didn't go back to it because we didn't know. I, I really. I mean, to be clear, I really laud the intention of what you're doing here. I love old buildings, and I've got three that I have to manage the leaks in. And <clears throat> but I would like to make a few points. Sure. Um, so I do think there's a huge difference between partial demo and full demo. I mean, if you start getting into partial demo, that's going to impact so many projects. Right. Um, as an architect, as a practicing architect, if this policy went into, became part of the town of Camden ordinances, if a client came to me having just bought one of these properties and wanted to do some renovations or possibly a demolition, the first thing I would have to say to them before we even started design is you should apply for a demolition permit right now because there may be a six month wait. So we would, so, and I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but that's what it would necessitate in order for the construction project not to get held up. And if there's significant, I mean, when we're talking about one and two million dollar projects if people have mortgages on this and owe the, owe the bank's money <clears throat> when you start putting in three and six months delays that affects construction schedules and budgets mm -hmm. i'm not saying don't do it i'm just talking from a real world perspective these are some of the things that these policies impact <clears throat> um, I, I i'm absolutely in favor of keeping this diverse, dense community that we have. I'm also very aware that you can't legislate beauty. And we talk about energy efficiency, and I'm all for energy efficiency, and I understand about the embodied energy that's in buildings. But I'd say probably the, the most energy efficient house in this town right now does not look at all traditional. Mm -hmm. It's probably the most untraditional, the, the net zero house in this town does not look traditional. And it's awesome because it's net zero, but it's got metal siding. It doesn't look like any of the other buildings around it. Should that building not be there? I mean, I think there's some really fundamental questions we have to ask ourselves. And it costs, it, I mean, so again, I'm very supportive of it, but it costs more to renovate than it does to build new, usually. That's one of the main reasons people choose not to do it, because it costs money to take all those old materials out and then rejig an old building and often you have to put almost as much material into the building and the structure in order to get it to meet current codes and stand up as you would a new building. So I think I, I really applaud what you're doing. I mean I wish there was some way to say okay so we still have this delay and we want to save our town and keep it beautiful. but. But there's nothing to stop somebody going and putting up a building that looks very much like the one in Rockport Harbour that everybody loves to hate, um, possibly for good reason. But, you know, I mean, it doesn't, I mean, that, that, they're the questions I have, and I'm just putting it out but there. But those are energy efficient buildings, as long as they're not 
you know, in the historic district, there's plenty of space in town. If somebody wants to do an energy efficient building, it's like it doesn't have to be <coughs> necessarily on High Street or. I, I would argue that every building should be as energy efficient as possible. And how you go, get about making that building energy efficient is very different depending on whether you're building something new or whether you're renovating an old building. Mm. I, uh, you know, and, and it's a very complicated question, how do you make a building energy efficient and what does being green mean? And everybody has a different answer to that. And it's very important we do that as much as we can, but, <clears throat> but it's not an easy thing to do. I understand. So, um, and just again, I, I think what you're planning on talking about doing and the intention behind it is fantastic. Just want to make sure whatever we come up with is really works in the way we want it to work and has some tangible effect. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. and the decision to go with a to notify and delay is really sort of the committee's decision. Is that with Jeremy's input or is it to, I mean, essentially it means stopping short of putting anything with teeth um, into the ordinance? Well, I mean, we got to put something in the ordinance um, if this is where the town wants to go and the committee is just They've, I think, them have done all the homework. Mm -hmm. um, they've kind of looked at what other towns have done, come up with, um, I thought, I think, a pretty good model or version of what other towns have done, um, and then, um, then it the idea would definition. be to, right, and then the idea would be to bring it to you folks, and then you guys do the hearing. Right, but uh, did you? But, I mean, the, the, the question was like, we're talking about a, a notify and delay, uh -huh. but arguably has very little teeth it, it imposes this delay period and then after that they can do whatever they want right where we saw a list of other towns that have stronger yeah. protections where you're actually restricted from doing certain things yeah. and the what i'm asking is the decision to forego that for now is that just to sort of get a baby step towards I, it that's, or is I it think that's and is that your strategic right. decision or is it the committee's decision or is it a combination or well the committee would like to have a full-blown historic preservation ordinance right. but we just felt that the town probably wasn't ready for that and right. so we decided to start with that piece right. but I, and I understand that that strategy my, my strategy might be to ask for the whole hog and see what I could get out of it you know um, you might but but um, has anybody tried is as what I mean what's the history of the town looking into possibly having a historic preservation ordinance um, well, no it didn't didn't go over well yeah. no I'm saying okay 2011 yeah <coughs> okay long ago. and I think would any of that be flirting with like architectural review um, so the uh, a full-on historic preservation ordinance is for the most part um, a design review using the Secretary of the Interior standards um, for treatment of historic properties is generally how those are and so generally you have to use windows that are compatible you know you generally can't put vinyl siding on a wood clapboarded building you generally can't put vinyl siding vinyl windows in the building um, so I mean I, I think so the decision was really to try since we knew back in 2011 twice it sounds like it, it got shot down yep okay that's, that's, that's why I was asking the, the history and what the, what the strategy was yep. yep that's helpful yep thank you Pat Okay. Yeah, thank you for, yeah. for yeah. that presentation. And so my plan, I guess, will be to try to um, maybe do another discussion with you folks on this, and I'll share the ordinance that they had prior, that we had worked like on a prior, workshop, or a workshop again. Make yeah, sense? Public, just a public yeah. board thing? Or well, it would be a public, it wouldn't be a public hearing, but we'd open, I mean. having I, people here on the yes. committee. I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Does thank you very good? much. Thank yeah, you. okay. <laughs> Thank you for coming, everybody. Appreciate you taking the time. Um, all right. I don't know where Jim Dorsky's got to. I'm not sure either. Um, We're going to make my time. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not sure either. We'll just keep going. Okay. Um, <coughs> so. Okay, so should we, can we move on to? Yes. We're moving on to number four. Number four, propose. Hi, oh. hey, sorry, we've got a guess, please. I'm going to have to go back through the ordinance and see how this works so we make sure that our timing is right. Okay. Not off the top of my head, no. Um, but feel free to reach out to the <coughs> planning office at any time. 
Um, and we can help you with that. that means we're gonna I will say I did hear from. Um, I have faith. You haven't seen Jeremy get going, have you? This is who knows, but it sounds like there may be good luck with that. interested in the property as a whole. He spent hours working um, on this project. I'm not sure. What now? I don't know. I have not heard from Jim. But, Jeremy um, doesn't do quick presentations. Of the office, what though? No question about the property. <coughs> The proposed zoning ordinance amendment. Minimum lot size. Let's table that. Till the next one. I'm so sorry. About the timing. Because the ordinance dictates the timing and when they have to do the public informational hearing from the time of the, um, the actual subject approval. So my gut says off the top of my head that that June 6th final meeting is not going to work. Right. That's why I asked that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm going to... Sure. So, ju just a question, I mean, can we can we take public input without Jim Dorsky being here? No. We need to find out what he's talking about. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not a formal... Right. It's an informal for the developer to talk. Mm. Correct. It's a major component of right. this meeting. When is it? I have no idea. Um, I mean, something might have happened, you know, but... I think that there was mutual agreement to extend it. I think those protections of time have to do with somebody, a developer being <coughs> against their will, was their request. I think that's how it works. But we did do a we had a we had a meeting on this a couple a month or so ago on this subdivision a preliminary meeting um, and then we did do a site visit site, site the planning board did do that and those were all noticed um, um, I thought frankly I thought the discussion with the planning board here and there was productive um, and I think we addressed or at least the board raised some concerns especially stormwater and drainage concerns in the area. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you've noticed. They're not looking at doing any development as part of the subdivision plan right now. Is that, is that, is that, is that part of the deal? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> what about the face? I have to do the face, too? Where's my boy Jeff? <laughs> We're in solidarity together. Yeah, Believe me, I'll be going that okay. route soon enough. I'm already, I'm already halfway there. So, so I mean, I think he does need to have another public. We need to have a public information. <coughs> yeah. All right. Sorry. Okay. That was. I mean, I think they they were obviously here for that and that in subdivision. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I don't know. I don't know. Is what it is. It happens. I don't. I don't text Jim Dorsky. So no. I, no, I'm sure I'm allowed to. I just don't. I think we just let it slide and, and um, make this one snappy. <laughs> all right, we will make this snappy. So yes. Okay. I think we're gonna have to, and Jim's the whole thing's gonna just be pushed out probably until July. Because we we don't have a formal application yet for the subject. Right. I think we just got a. I mean, Jim knew. They all left after the historic thing. Well, we're glad you got to that first. We're here that we're for the subdivision. Oh, back there. Yeah. yeah, that's what they were here for. So. They got to listen to that wonderful presentation on All right. All right. Um, I'm back on. Okay. So the what next item, to number cover four, this zoning ordinance amendment, um, initial Mission discussion. Point. We had talked about this prior. Um, if you look through the zoning ordinance, um, B1, yes. zoning district has no minimum lot size for non-residential and no minimum lot size for residential. BTR, this is the Knox Mill building. Um, primarily, that's all that's in the BTR in town. Um, there's no minimum lot size. If that building was 100% non-residential, there's no minimum lot size required. Since it's residential, there is mixed use. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the non-resident, so the residential pieces of that property are required. Since it's multifamily, have to have 1,500 square feet per dwelling unit of lot size. Um, what's, what's FU stand for? SFU stand for single family. Single family. Yeah, um, yeah single family unit. Um, 
So what do they do? Combine it in the property because it's an apartment or a condominium complex? Right, right. So we looked right now, we looked at the whole property and said, okay, there's, I don't remember the acreage, but. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have one of those? Is that what's current or is that what you're proposing? No, that's what's current. Okay. What I'm proposing is uh, just on the bottom to um, amend the minimum lot size. I mean, I frankly think we ought to not have a minimum lot size for even not for even residential in the BTR, um, similar to B1. I mean, we they're allowed to cover the lot lot line to lot line with building and parking if they want. Lot line to lot line. There's no coverages. There's no maximum building coverage in that there zone. Are setbacks at least. Um, Minimum setbacks in the BTR, similar to B1. Um, so the impetus for this, although this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me from a planning perspective, it's kind of like the parking issue. To, in my my view, downtown parking um, shouldn't require people to have parking on their site when people come to a downtown and they visit five different stores or five you know five different entities downtown. Why do they all need parking? Um, regardless this is about lot size um so in 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 the town's um move to acquire the knox mill parking lots from matt warren and the um the old skateboard skate park property to create parking um after review jim dorsky and i are going through we're gonna have to go through subdivision approval the town is to actually to obtain these properties from matt um since we're a new owner um or would be the minimum lot size does not work in order to facilitate that parking lot change <laughs> um, it's unfortunate um, so my proposal would be to go down to 500 square feet per dwelling unit um, as opposed to 1500 um, and then then that whole parking lot scenario scheme works perfectly um, Again, I'd like to rather go. I'd rather go down to none required in the BTR. That said, some people may have heartburn over it for some reason. Um, I don't. It doesn't cause me any concern at all from a planning perspective, knowing where the BTR is. I know I don't have a good zoning map in front of you. Um, I can go grab one. Um, I, I will say there's a whole host of things I'm finding in our zoning ordinance that's really wacky. Um, do you want me to go get the big map? I can. Um, this one where BTR is right here. Well, I think we're good. Yeah. The river house is in it. Right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, Bella Point or whatever they call that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm all about dense. Uh, I know. I know you are, and I mean that's that's how I am when it comes to the, uh, the downtown core. <clears throat> I mean, we don't require it in the B1, but right across the street we require it. I mean, it's. Um, I mean, this is built it up. It can be a town. hard sell to a certain mentality that exists in Maine, in this part of Maine, where we have one acre lots. You know, you go down these country roads and you have 40,000 square foot lots, and then every house is poked right on the street. I mean, it makes no sense, but it sort of gets into the mindset where people think that property and land is protection. But mm -hmm. I think Camden's like that. I mean, and I, think, I mean, I think we're dealing with in-town development too. Correct. I mean, this I, you is just in-town development. Dealt with that in, out in Washington, right. it was all about rural living and two-acre mm -hmm. lots, and mm -hmm. guess what? You get sprawl. But right. Yeah. It's, this but is, we're we're in the downtown yeah. core still. Um, the, these recommendations that you're making would then have to get voted on. I mean, they've got to be put yeah. before yeah. the town, to to like town everything. Public so hearing on it, town yeah. select board, yeah. and then public yeah. and then yeah. town vote. It's very odd. If you look in our um, BR zone, which is just the third listing there, um, single family requires 5,000 square feet. Two family requires 5,000 square feet. But if I want a three family home, I only need 4,300 square feet. It's just, yeah. somebody had a three family. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. <laughs> be going over with a fine tooth comb, doesn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> the whole ordinance. I, there, there were some other ones that Steve and I found the other day, and we're just like, how on? What are we going to do? Yeah. I mean, it's going to require, and I've already started kind of doing it on, on a page by page. When I find something, make a note of it, 
so that it can be addressed in the it's future. It's been a long winter, hasn't it, Jeremy? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. You have a in the office, is that? <laughs> I may. Um, I may be living in the office if I stay here long enough. Right. Um, so oh, I, I, I also out. do support the, the dense urban yeah. or whatever. Um, I, do, I do have some concerns when I see a target sort of as a, almost an ad hoc application mm -hmm. of, of changing the, the code. Um, to facilitate X purchase I, I or something get that. like that. I really I worry about those things in general. I get that. So it gets my hackles up a little. Yeah. Um, if but it I'm, wasn't appropriate, I wouldn't propose it. No, I know, yeah. I know. It, it's and I get that part of it. It's not it's not an accusation. It's yeah. just sort of one of those things that I think as a board we need to be considering Absolutely. as we go forward that that this is something that has enough general application that it's a reasonable thing and not just spot zoning around. Absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I'm really alert to that. <clears throat> I think that. It's been a practice in this town a little bit to, to before your tenure here, but to, to do that spot zoning, I, I, and maybe some on your watch as well. But it, you know, it goes a to, lot of it in that area. It goes, it goes, and it goes to the it goes to the you know to the vote to the public. I mean, the boathouse is one one example. Of, you know, we just we changed something for one specific building, um, and maybe it was the right call, maybe it wasn't. I didn't I didn't weigh in on it myself. I don't really have an opinion on it, but I do worry about those specific targeted um, yeah. changes. I mean, I'm also going to look at, start looking at lot sizes in general mm -hmm. because, um, you know, we need to start trying, I think, we got an issue with not enough housing in town. Mm -hmm. Are there things we can do to, you know, reduce lot size, especially especially on sewer and watered mm -hmm. lots to reduce the lot size and get a little more infill built in mm -hmm. town? That's a little, that will be a little more, I think, a harder sell for people mm -hmm. in neighborhoods like Pearl Street. Um, you know, people are pretty used to what what the lot sizes are, you like you're saying. You should try walking down. I mean, what amazes me about, I mean, I live on Pearl Street, and what's incredible about that neighborhood is how many little accessory dwelling units there are in back of mm -hmm. one sort and another. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's all sorts of really effectively tiny houses mm -hmm. that get rented out for various reasons. So it's already... It's already happening. It's already happening. There, yeah. I mean, and yeah. every time I take the and we do have the like, accessory wow, dwelling wonderful. unit yeah. provision that allows yeah. allows that's what them. I use for mine. Yeah. But at the same time, you look at what happened recently in Rockland. Mm -hmm. You know, when they tried mm -hmm. to increase the density without probably any public. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that was, Input, that was you know, but that all, there was a reason behind that, too. That all got squashed completely, though. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'd like whatever we put forward to be So are we supposed to take some action on this today? Is no, this, this is just a discussion, information kind of thing. And I guess what I'd like to do is, um, I mean, we need to, I need to try to do this so Jim can start working on subdivision change for this. I mean, it's a really weird subdivision so when I reviewed the old approvals there was a point on one of the plans the most recent plan they counted the area that is in the <coughs> mill pond as lot area yeah they used the lot area that we used to assess as the lot area and if you read the ordinance <coughs> you can't count that area but the prior planning board actually reviewed it and okay it's a body of water. It, right. And okayed it based on the lot area that included the water. So I think if I I'd have to look at the plan Jim gave me, but if I went down that same road and was consistent with the prior planning board subdivision approval, I think we might be able to get away with doing it. Um, but that's not the ordinance doesn't allow that and I'd rather be um, consistent with what the zoning ordinance they allows. Didn't Water is the most valuable asset on a property for tax wise. I mean, it's such an interesting thing. I mean, so we say that we have a dwelling, you're required to have 1,500 square feet per dwelling <laughs> unit, but then we say you can cover your lot with building to the max and you can cover your lot with parking to the max. So it's not like we're saying that 1,500 square feet is open space or green space for the dwelling units. It's just mm -hmm. a lot area requirement mm -hmm. that doesn't really, it, you know, if they can fill the, if they can fill the lot 100% with building. Um, Why not it, have a smaller lot? Right, you know, it just doesn't make sense. It seems so, like there are many districts where you can't have residential use at street level. Mm -hmm. 
and it, maybe it makes sense to make that apply to all those districts because if, you, <coughs> if you've got the commercial use, it's not using any more lot area mm. to have a residential use above. You still have to have parking, but mm. so that would be the BH, mm. BTH. I just wondered if, to keep it from being so. So on the BTH here, yeah, you explain how that reads. It's non-residential and residential is 20,000 square feet, all right, except single-family unit. So, so the this is um, this is I think one of the ones that I had the same question with with Steve and I. We're like, um, <coughs> what does this mean? Yeah, what what, what is required? Mm -hmm. Um, let me just get to exactly what the ordinance said. As currently written here. Yeah. <coughs> BTH, right? BTH. Oh. And one day we'll just, we're going to do this whole thing all over again. And we can put all the development tables in the back. Mm. In a s separate section, so it's not in the like code in itself. Like in the, yeah, yeah. I mean that's that's what this this ordinance needs. Um, I'm looking for the page now. I'm sorry. If you like a carpenter, once you've got all our ordinances working perfectly, it'll be time for you to retire, Jeremy. Oh, there it is. BTH, right? Yes. Yeah. So BTH, minimum lot area. It says minimum lot area is twenty thousand square feet. What it says it doesn't say residential or non-residential it just says so i assumed that's minimum lot area 20,000 square feet and then it says minimum lot area per dwelling unit is 1500 square feet two family dwellings need 1500 square feet and if multi-family need 1500 square feet I, they should could have said single single all units need 1500 square feet per dwelling unit but well um, maybe is it is it 21 zone 21,500 square feet if you're going to do commercial and have a single family home does it That's need crazy. to be re uh, commercial on the first floor in that zone yes so maybe that's what's going on you need yep. 20,000 square feet and then if you're going to have residential above you need an additional 1500 per, per I yeah I know is that I think you have to go to the building company <laughs> so building coverage in that zone. Um, One hundred percent subject to <laughs> shoreline zoning view corridors. We cut this meeting short. So part of that building lot is twenty thousand square feet. They reach the Knox Mill. Right? I, and then max ground coverage. It sense. doesn't make any yeah. sense. Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. Minimum lot area is 20,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. And you've got minimum lot area per dwelling. Should you be doing a bit more of a wholesale revision of what's going on here if it's, um, you know, we, you potentially, out, I mean, it seems like you're finding out that. Yeah, potentially. And maybe what I ought to do is just grab a couple of these and try to get handle a couple of them. Um, I mean, I can't do a whole wholesale review on no, all of no, these. No, but I'm just seeing what's happening here. And I think what I ought to do is maybe try to look what, at a couple of these zones and just, or a handful of them and try yeah. to address them at one point, one time, and then get those, get those approved and then come back and kind of just kind of piecemeal. Maybe the ones where they're not 
there's no residential use at street level. I mean, right, I'm, I'm, I'm get, is, is, is there a certain urgency yeah, to this that's because of wanting there to sell this certain urgency to project? It. Yeah. I mean, can you start off with that particular zone? I can probably start off with the ones that um, involve have, selling don't allow residential on the first floor. The stuff that's going to involve buying stuff from and that, that <coughs> Matt are in the down, right? down, downtown core. So that would take care of what you need to get done here? I think so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, maybe in the explanation again to Ethan's point about not spot zoning. Yeah, B BTR, BTH. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, and when we're putting it forward to the town with the explanation, I wouldn't necessarily think that there's part of the selling point saying that we're doing this in order for, to facilitate yeah, buying for something from an individual is, is maybe such, I mean, maybe you find other positive reasons for why it should happen. Well, there's a ton of re positive reasons to look yeah. at this. I mean, there, yeah. there are. I mean, just so that we don't have anything in writing where people can go look, they're like favoring one person or, mm -hmm. you know, it's a... Well, it doesn't make any sense if, you know, if, if you can't, if you have to be over a commercial use <coughs> and a residence and there's no limit on the lot to the commercial use. Right. Mm -hmm. What right. are you saving that area for? Especially if you can cover the whole lot with building yeah. or parking. I mean, it makes yeah. I, yeah. makes no sense. Well, wouldn't that be the use they're looking for is parking? That wouldn't be that much. But you need one in that district now. You need one, one, per, dwelling one unit. per dwelling unit. And that's like what? Fifteen by nine by eighteen at the biggest. hundred fifty square feet. Yeah, it's not fifteen. No, gosh, no. Do we have a shortage of commercial space in town? Um, I would say we do. Okay, I mean, if there was more space available, it would get leased. Okay. So, so same as there's a shortage of housing too. Yep. I mean, there's just in general. Okay. I'm good. I'll work on a couple, and I, you might have been out of the room, but we're going to try to look at like three or four of these that require no no residential on the first floor. Look at those for dwelling units. Yep. Lot size per dwelling unit, and then just do it as kind of three or four of these at a time. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I mean, whatever you need to do to start making it sensible. Sure. Right. It does. Right. It doesn't make and aligning it. I mean, yeah, that's no, what want, your wonderful idea yeah, Jeremy says. Makes sense for sure. Um, all right, that's all I have for you. I'll work all on right. that, and I'll, I'll come up with a draft for the five. next next time we meet. We're getting there, Number Ethan. Five. We're getting there. Um, really quick, Rosie, you mentioned something about energy efficiency. Just so you know, I am working on, and this kind of doesn't have to do with planning, but I am working on a um, kind of a, um, efficiency Camden program where the town of Camden will um, assist homeowners with energy um Improvement projects on their homes financially. That comes out of um, trust pro funds, property taxes, trust funds that the town has. Trust funds that the town has. Mm -hmm. We're limited on where we can use that. So if you, um, if you're, um, and just that's good to have a fair amount of money. Um, we won't probably be able to help. Okay, you. I mean that, but, but for to help lower to moderate low income, income folks, similar to efficiency main, similar to efficiency main, where they do rebates, we, we're going to. We're going to create a program that will um, you, how you help. Funds. We'll provide funds for air sealing, insulating. Mm. Back take that a year. <laughs> <laughs> or two. And, and, um, yeah, and, I mean that that makes complete. <laughs> four years, please. And, and doing heat, heating, high efficiency um, heating equipment. Do we'll we'll we're going to work on on this big picture. So I just wanted to share that with you. I think cool. it's huge. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, Mark Rosenbaum, who's one of my energy gurus, always says, you know, there's no point getting your house 100%, you should get your house 90% and then go spend that other 10% on helping your neighbor get their house. Because in, in reality, we need to get everybody's house to 90%. We do, and know, I mean, the energy committee's, kind of, energy committee's kind of, energy committee's kind of been driving this a little bit, not this portion, but they've been driving, the town needs to deal with, we need more solar so we can reduce our, you know, our carbon emissions. I get that, but the biggest, suck on fossil fuels in this town are residential properties. Right, and it's and heat, heating is what yes. Yes, heating and it's is not, what sucks it's not, it. yeah. And it's so not an town easy town properties. Yeah. It's yeah. everyone's properties. And yeah. we can only do our part so much. I mean we had a lot of responsibilities town government does. So if we Absolutely. can do things to help 
um, people renovate their homes, improve their homes efficiency-wise, then we're going to do it. So, Sounds share that terrific. With you. Thank you. Um, and so discussion on meeting schedule. Yeah. Um, I will reach out to Jim tomorrow. Um, we are going to have subdivision plan review on the 6th. That looks not at all likely at this point. I don't see how we can do that. Okay. Um, why, why can't we? I, well, we're going to have to have another meeting, public informational meeting, have to do that. And it can be on the same night as the review, I, I believe. Okay, I, I'll have to go through it. Maybe it can. I just have to go through. Well, and, that was my fault. Well, um, Jim's a professional, so. Um, what was what was your fault? That the pre-application meeting had been advertised and scheduled to be held, and I missed the fact that neighbors had to be noticed. That wasn't the applicant's fault. Mm. Well, so, he should have been on top of it a little bit. Yeah, in that, my opinion. Plenty of neighbors showed up. A couple of people. Well, the prior meeting, I think Jeannie's referring to. Okay. But I mean, yeah. Jim, you know, I've known it was. I mean, tonight. He, he, sh he knew. I mean, are we going to approve these minutes? Oh, sh sure. Are we? Do we? Are we? Are we? Yeah, are we supposed to approve? But I've not I, had a chance to review them. them because Jeannie left me out. I know he was there. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> I wanted on the record. <laughs> I walked over from my house. I've, I've not had a chance to read through the minutes. That's. Uh, it's fine. I think you, you should have them before the review. Um, okay. You have to say that you were there. Okay. So, but if I'm supposed to like approve these, I need to read them first. Just yep. so. Take your time. No longer than 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I wish Jeff was here, man. <laughs> what, what happened to Jeff? No, Jeff is not here. Did you notice? Yeah, what happened to Jeff? I don't know. I texted him too. Me neither. He's, I think he told me last week I'll see you on Tuesday. Yeah, he's busy. All right. Or Thursday. Sometimes things come up. Um, they do. Okay. Anything? Is there anything else we need to? So we're not sure what's going to happen at the next meeting, but you we guys don't know. Will I, will dig, know. I will dig into that tomorrow. I'm not in the office a whole lot tomorrow, but I'll, I'll dig into it a little bit. Um, June, um, the third meeting in June, just so you all know, I am on vacation. Um, I have family in from California, um, and I, I need, need to spend some time. Well, and turn your cell phone off. So I don't know how that will play out with this subdivision and the meetings, so um, we'll see. Um, Do you I, have to I be here? I won't be here. No. Okay. I think you and I chatted about this maybe a little bit. Do I have to okay. be here? And I'm going to say no, I don't. Um, but what I would do if we're going to move forward on that subdivision on that night, um, I, what I would do is I would at least go through all of the approval standards for a subdivision, similar like we, I did on the approval standards for the site plan for Cranesport. Went through, yeah, and at least you had copies of them. Yeah. And then I referenced why or whatever. I, I would like to do that for you for that meeting for the subdivision so that you don't have to go through each individual one. I mean, you're going to make your determination, but right. I would like to at least give you. Like you to do that too. That would be nice. <laughs> makes sense to me. I mean, it it makes perfect sense. So I will do that for you for that meeting, and okay. maybe I'll have Steve um, be here if along he with Cheney on that sure. day. So should we condition his vacation on getting that done? <laughs> <laughs> and getting us out of here before seven o'clock at night. I know, and that's what I don't mean. Don't know so, what's going on with that. Don't yeah. know what's going on. Um, well, they had a boundary line issue. There was a boundary line issue. We're talking about the Tibbets again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think a couple of boundary line issues. So they had to get that resolved before they could do the final plan. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and like I, I mentioned to those folks, there was someone that came into the office that had interest in buying the entire property. Um, for a business, so it may be who knows, but it might. Do you know what kind of business? I do, but I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> we don't call a good try, anymore. good try. <laughs> I would like it. <laughs> we call it we call a dog, a dog kennel. <laughs> <laughs> no dog kennels. That's well, what I want. I mean, Next to my, my house is a dog kennel. 
I mean, it's my hope oh. that it, uh, it's my hope that it comes to fruition because it would be a cool, cool oh. thing for for town. Okay, um, that's great. <laughs> look at that, look at the grin on their faces. Like, what is it? What is it? Remind you of Vermont. Oh, Vermont, a, a sugar shack. Yeah. All right. During the meeting. Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Yeah. All right. Are Does we all someone set? make a motion? All right. Oh, so, motion to adjourn. And it, so we've had a motion to adjourn. Anybody want I to will second? second that. Okay, seconded. All those in favor? Here, here. Aye. Yeah. Rosie, yes. Richard and Matt, yes. did either any of you pick up the signed plan? Was the plan by mistake? Remember we did site plan approval the last time? Wouldn't that, that would have all been all big and we would have had to fold it up and tuck it in our yeah, back pocket. Yeah. I think we would have That's noticed that. Yeah, if you just sure. This one. Sure. Well, Thank you, gentlemen. I'll date it the date of the meeting. So I don't need to because I've already signed. Do you need me to no, sign this one? You weren't oh, there. Even better.